Item number SCP-093. Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. See Testing Document SCP-093-T1 for outline of testing conditions. SCP-093 must remain on a mirror at all times and under video surveillance. Admittance into the area of SCP-093's containment must be authorized only with proper video recording and subject retrieval procedures in place. Any attempt to use SCP-093 outside of an approved test will be dealt with severely up to and including termination. Description. SCP-093 is a primarily red disc carved from a stone composite resembling cinnabar, with circular engravings and unknown symbols carved at 0.5 cm depth around the entire object. Deeper cuts are present on SCP-093 with a depth of 1 to 1.5 cm. SCP-093 is 7.62 cm in diameter and fits comfortably into most palms without abrasion. SCP-093 will change hue when held by a living individual. The colors taken by SCP-093 are still being researched to establish a link. Current belief holds that the changes depend upon regrets carried by the holder. If SCP-093 is removed from a mirror and not held by a person, it will seek out the nearest mirror-like surface. SCP-093 has been observed to travel in the largest possible circle while rolling, building up phenomenal speed. The mechanism of its acceleration is currently unknown. If an obstacle is between SCP-093 and the nearest mirror-like surface, it will use its momentum to punch through the obstacle and continue on its course at this speed. It will only stop when a mirror-like surface is contacted. Despite tremendous impact velocities, no damage will be dealt to SCP-093 or the mirror. Additional Notes no records exist to clarify the nature of SCP-093's discovery or presence in the Foundation CSCP-093-0D. Since no records exist explaining SCP-093's method of containment, a test procedure was initiated to establish why mirrors must be used to contain it. The results of SCP-093-T1 led to the discovery of living beings holding SCP-093 being able to move through mirrors in the series of tests in SCP-093-T2 to ascertain the destination reached through this travel. Since the original documentation is somewhat out of date, I will still read this for clarification. SCP-093 original documentation is as follows. Item number SCP-093, Object Class Euclid. Special containment procedures are as follows. Item SCP-093 is to be kept on a silver-lined mirror on a 1 foot by 9 inch pedestal at least 4 feet off the ground floor in containment cell block. Object is not to be contained in areas exceeding 12 by 10 feet, nor placed on mahogany, pine, cherry, or aluminum pedestals above or below level 1 of containment cell block. Object can be handled safely, albeit gently, without consequences. Tests and consequences thereof involving containment conditions can be viewed in Section B-35-1 of the attached report. Original Description Object was found on the shore of the Red Sea, January 30, 1968, emitting a low sigh and a dim blue gleam. Its color has since turned into an orange mix of red, only emanating a hum of varying volume whilst in the presence of female examiners of ages between 34 and 41. SCP-093 resembled the documented blue for 5434 at 123 on April 26, 1986, coincidentally when the body of 1949834 was discovered in a research facility. Ties between 1949834 and SCP-093 remain inconclusive and effects of prolonged exposure to 093 remain unknown, except for infrequent reports of periods of calmness and in the case of 2420049 as periodic waves of depression, loss of balance, and thoughts of suicide. These feelings have reportedly not exceeded 11 days in duration. Objects seem to react at the presence of 2420056 by turning light violent for no more than 2 minutes and 9 seconds as documented on March 12, 1993. Effects of this reaction remain unknown. Additional Notes Origins of 093 remain unknown and documents of recovery of 093 have since been destroyed in a fire at research facility December 9, 1989. 
Reports on the feelings of researchers who handled 093 have remained inconsequential since April 19, 1995. End original document. SCP-093-T1 containment tests are as follows. Testing of SCP-093 against conditions set forth for existing containment procedures to access viability of continuing such containment, beginning with changing the type of mirror used as a position of rest. Mirror Surface Brass Frame Retail Grade Mirror SCP-093 rests without activity when placed on the mirror. This test alone removes the need for costly silver or wooden containment systems. Standard Grade Table SCP-093 turns upright and begins to roll across the table surface in one direction, making a U-turn and rolling to the other, completing an oval shape and repeating its action until a mirror is brought into the vicinity of it, at which time SCP-093 rolls towards the mirror and lays flatways against it, sliding towards the center. It is noted that despite the grainy feel of SCP-093, it does not mark the mirror in any fashion while moving across it. Two mirrors at either end of a standard grade table. SCP-093 gravitates towards the closer mirror, regardless of orientation and makes no distinction between different types of mirrors, favoring a factor of distance above all else of choosing the mirror to move to. A mirror held by a person that moved around. SCP-093 follows the mirror as it moves, gaining speed until a maximum velocity of is reached. At any velocity, the impact of SCP-093 against a mirrored surface results in no damage to either object. A person holding SCP-093 placing it on a mirror. This test was accidental, the result of one of the staff tripping another after some debate about who would be covering the lunch tab. As a result of the behavior of the researchers, it was discovered that a person holding SCP-093 and placing it against a mirror will in fact move into the mirror. Addendum. Containment testing discontinued after establishing that SCP-093 requires only a mirror to rest inert. Testing on human interaction with mirrors while holding SCP-093 authorized by Dr. SCP-093-T2 Mirror Test Testing Protocols Subjects testing SCP-093 must wear a Class III buckle harness strapped to the chest and attached to a tension pulley system allowing for 300 meters or 1,000 feet of movement. Additional spools may be added for extended movement if necessary. The clasp connecting these spools must be high grade and capable of withstanding applied force of 0.2 tons. A field kit containing the following should be standard issue for testing of SCP-093. One wrist-mounted light source with three hours lifespan and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours. Four 0.5 liter water bottles for, with water inside. Four MREs of any type, plus two plain granola bars, chocolate chips allowed. One standard issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 24 rounds of ammunition loaded. This is not to be issued until subject has passed into a mirror using SCP-093 and should be given under armed supervision ensuring that the subject passes through entirely. This item is to be requisitioned first upon subject's return, and subject is to be made aware of this before leaving line of sight within SCP-093's mirror. One standard issue field knife. The subject is not to be made aware of this item and must find it on its own within the kit. The subject must also be attached to a video system with a camera mounted on the subject's head or shoulders. The video device should be cable-based and allow for the same length of travel as the return system. Wireless cameras have shown mixed results and should only be used in testing conditions where SCP-093 is a currently known color. New colors must be tested using wired feed. During testing, the color of SCP-093 must be recorded, as well as history of the subject in terms of their incarceration to identify how SCP-093 determines the color to assume. A link appears to be connected to guilt or a lack thereof in the subject's psyche. The attached test results should be read in order. SCP-093's document is now concluded. Please see the attached audio file containing SCP-093 blue test written on it to continue on with this test results.
Order Test 1. Color Blue. Subject is D-20384, male, 34 years of age, strong physique. Subject's background shows incidents of murder, attempted suicide. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a blue color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to an outdoor landscape, heavily tinged in blue. Video feed follows an attached media. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking over the same field reported by technicians. Looks like typical lowland plains. Everything has a heavy blue tinge overlapping the normal colors. No discernible landmarks visible as subject pans view left to right. Only grass, weeds, and a breeze move in the taller grass. No trees, no living beings visible. Subject moves forward as instructed, traveling for approximately 500 steps before something becomes visible. A patch of the land ahead is barren and grass can be seen dying as subject approaches it. Approximately 300 steps forward, subject is standing before a hole in the ground. The hole has been dug using unknown tools of primitive origin. Pulley system engaged and the camera suffers a light shudder. Subject is instructed to enter the hole, and after a mild protesting agrees to do so. There is no apparent method of descent such as ladder or rope. Subject relies entirely on his own hands and the pulley system is slowed to descent. Approximately 100 meters of cable is used before a bottom is reached. Light source provided in field kit activated 50 meters down when outside sources become unreliable. Sweeping gestures of the light reveal nothing more than dirt, even at the bottom of the hole. Subject moves forward with assistance of light source. Ask about the blue tinge. Subject expresses confusion and says there is no such tinge from his perspective, and never was. Light is visible down the passage and 150 meters of cable has been used. Out of the camera's eye, sound is recorded of the firearm being prepared. When questioned about these actions, subject states justified precaution and moves forward. The tunnel turns from bare dirt to a concrete enclosure. Subject complains of a stench. The light source is revealed to be ceiling light fixtures, a series of which with less than a quarter broken while the others function. A series of six doors. Three to a side, spanned before the camera view with a seventh door visible at the end of the corridor that has been blocked by what looks like generic metal shelving debris. Debris shows signs of rusting and is typical of retail store units suggesting other human presences. Subject requested to try doors in whatever order he chooses. Subject tries first door on the right, door is locked, does not open. Second door tries to open but does not budge, unlocked but blocked. Closing second door, third door is tried, same results as first. Going up the other side, the third door does fully open and light is bright in the room. Portable light switched off at this time as subject pans camera to inspect the room. Room is bare, no contents, but walls are filthy. Subject states material on walls isn't dirt, but he can't identify it. Seems to resemble melted plastic, but is brown in color rather than black. Door is closed. Second door on left side has no handle, does not move when pushed. The hole where the handle was is plugged by unknown material. All doors are shaped in such a way that nothing can visibly escape from the sides, and space for movement is too thin to look through, even at ground level. First door on left hand is locked, but part of key is present and locked from stem onto the ridges. The back has been broken off. With effort, subject manipulates key to open door and immediately begins coughing, complaining of a stench. Walls of room are clean as its floor. Ceiling is coated in strange brown material as the third room. In this room is a makeshift cot made from aged blankets with a pillow, a wooden crate containing open boxes of what appears to have been foodstuffs. Language appears on video as squiggles, however, subject states they clearly read cereal. A second crate in the room contains what appears to be empty water bottles that have been dried out. A book lays next to the cot, closed. No title or identifying marks. On the wall is what appears to be clipped articles, but language cannot be read. Subject asks to remove clippings for retrieval. All articles but one crumbles at the touch due to age. The intact article is put in a filled sample container and it seems the most recent compared to the others. Asked to investigate the book, subject begins to move towards it. Audio on the tape goes strange and a high-pitched screeching noise like grinding metal dominates all communication for 3.5 seconds. 
Subject has not touched the book still, and when the noise stopped, Subject asked Control to repeat requests. Control made no request during that time as headsets were removed. Subject advised to leave room and notice the door has begun closing slowly on its own if left alone will close. Subject advised to leave door alone and to investigate door on the right. Careful review of the following ten seconds of tape shows that the camera pans. A figure is visible at the end of the tunnel where the seventh door is. The door is open only enough for a face to be seen through a crack just before the door silently closes. No details can be seen. Subject investigates the second door on the right with no mention of anything seen out of the ordinary. This door, when pushed against, moves, and after repeated bashings, moves enough to view inside at an angle. A cork board is visible with more articles attached to it. The top of a box of cereal can be seen on the floor, and what appears to be a hand laying palm up. Subject closes door and pans camera past door 7, which remains closed. Seeing nowhere else to explore, subject requested to return. Subject poses no protest and complains of ever-increasing stench. As Subject returns back down the tunnel, his camera feed does not change or show anomaly, but Control reports a sudden surge in cable movement pulling an additional 100 meter of cable through before going slack again and then tightening. Video feed shows Subject ascending tunnel slowly while Control attempts to verify integrity of the pulley system. Subject requested to stop ascent, but states he is not climbing. The rope is pulling him up. Panic sets in on both sides as Subject informed to ready firearm. Upon reaching top of hold, nothing is visible on camera, and subject reports nothing has changed in landscape, then begins a return trip following the path of the cable. Traveling for approximately 900 steps, subject asks how much cable he has used. Control admits they are unsure due to complications, but subject traveled in a straight line to reach the hole, so it should be a straight line back. Subject becomes concerned when he states that more cable is visible now, moving at a 90 degree angle away from a point in the ground. Subject pans camera around full circle slowly. On film, behind Subject, a crowd of 37 countable figures stand silently. Features are unidentifiable, and they are lacking the blue tinge that dominates the landscape. Panic breaks the control again, but Subject notes only oddity as being the cable having an angled path. Subject tugs his end of the cable. It is taut and does not move. Subject begins to reel in the pulley system and slack rapidly winds. Watching the angled cable movement can be seen as grass is disturbed further down the angled portion from the reeling, and then the line vibrates as it meets resistance and emits a twang from the recoil. Subject's camera pans back along length of cable, which now appears to slowly be allowing more slack before suddenly all slack is returned and pulley system begins again. Control requests subject return following cable path, and screams are caught on the audio with panic from subject. Five shots fired as Subject aims pistol at something not visible on camera. Control reports being able to see Subject returning toward point of origin, while camera shows wire disappearing to, into a point floating in the air. As Subject passes this point, all cable is now in the pulley system, and camera films only the floor. Control reports that the mirror took approximately five seconds to return to a reflection, and SCP-093 remained blue in color until one hour after being recovered from the Subject. A vile smelling fluid was present on subject's clothes around his hands when firearm was recovered. This fluid dried quickly and was deemed insignificant of study due to lack of quality sample. Control personnel monitoring the mirror state have seen a massive human being crawling on the ground, easily fifty times the size of a normal person with no facial features and a very short arm reach, pulling itself towards the mirror before it returned to a reflection. Due to proximity fine details could not be made out, but at least one observer noted the being appeared to have been shot from the marks in the otherwise smooth, featureless face. Field test kit recovered from subject containing a newspaper article that reads and was filed as item The next test is classified as the green test.
SCP-093 Green Test Mirror Test 2 Color Green Subject is D-54493, female, 23 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows instance of Grand Theft Auto and second-degree murder of two children during escape with vehicle. Subject is cooperative in all steps of testing. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093 which emitted a green color. Outside, technicians observed the mirror maintained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a farming landscape, heavily tinged in green, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera activates, flickers to view. Subject is looking out over the same farmland reported by technicians. All greens through video feed are deeper and green tinge overlays the normal colors of objects similar to the blue tinge in Test 1. No landmarks from Test 1 are discernible as subject pans camera over area. Present is a field, long abandoned, in the middle of which stands the remains of a scarecrow of unknown design. Fragments left are rotted and torn. Nothing grows in the tilled land. A farmhouse is visible to the right of the field, large, two stories, a basement shelter enters the visible at one end. Subject prepares her sidearm immediately and is asked by control to relax before proceeding, her heavy breathing dominating the audio feed. Subject takes a few minutes and announces that she's fine, then proceeds to direct it to walk the perimeter of the farmhouse. Children's bicycles, two, a boys and girls, lay against the house near the shelter doors. One of the doors to the shelter lay in the grass. Torn from the entrance is evidenced by splintering wood. On the stairs lays clothes arranged in a descending order. Shoes to shirt going down to belonging to a boy. Subject begins screaming at Control asking if this is some sort of sick joke. Control assures her that they have never seen this environment either and to please calm down. Subject takes several minutes to regain herself before continuing. It is unknown if SCP-093 is linking the subject's past with her landscape. After several minutes, subject agrees to continue. Communication to subject is muted and conversations of control asking commentary about subject's jittery attitude make up audio for one and a half minutes. Communication restored as subject reaches bottom of stairs. The cellar of the farmhouse is unremarkable and typical. Several wooden shelves line the far wall containing unidentified canned substances. Broken light fixtures sway gently from support beams. The camera is panned across the basement slowly. No evidence of footprints are visible and the basement can be assumed to have been abandoned for some time. Subject begins to comment about a stench. As subject pans the area, a metal hatch is visible on the ground, similar to a bulkhead on a submarine with a turn handle. Subject remarks that the smell is at its worst around the hatch and the dirt around the hatch is noted as being clumped and clay-like. The handle of the hatch is old and the paint chipped. Subject coerced into turning the handle which, when fully turned, opens the hatch. Subject begins coughing at the release of assumed old, stale air. When camera is tilted the view down the hatch, it is a white concrete tunnel similar to the one found in the blue experiment but in much better condition. Subject asks to descend ladder and close hatch behind her. After some convincing, subject agrees to descend but does not close the hatch. Overlooked concerns about severing the pulley return system and doing so are acknowledged. Descent down the ladder and trip to the farmhouse has consumed approximately 53 meters of cable when bottom is reached. The inside of the hatch appears to be a bunker ill-suited to long-term usage. It is spacious, about half the size of the actual cellar itself, containing three bunks, one for a couple and two for single use. Several boxes of food similar to those found during Blue marked as cereal fill a waste container near the hatch bottom. On the beds are two skeletons and on the floor is a third lying next to which is a simple six-shooter revolver containing no ammunition. Three spent casings are across the floor near the gun. On the other side of the skeleton is a bound book in good condition. This is retrieved and placed in a field kit container upon request. The gun is left alone per request from control. Subject examines more of the bunker, focusing on a desk where a newspaper has been cut and is in good condition. The clipped articles are recovered using a field kit container. Little else of interest to be brought back is in the bunker as the camera is panned around. Trash bags containing clothing, a few children's toys resembling popular 1950s era products are lined against the wall. 
Subject is requested to leave the bunker and then sharply asked to wait by a control technician who directs the camera view to an area near the exiting doorway to the hatch. Closer inspection as subject moves in finds that a small area has been fitted with what appears to be an ethernet jack, the cover of which has been forced slightly away from the wall by a strange amber-like substance. Subject refuses to touch or collect a sample commenting that it stinks so bad that if they want it they can come get it themselves. Control declines and subject leaves bunker. As subject grips ladder to leave, the camera pans up for a moment and at the top of the tunnel a humanoid figure is seen peering down. Control asks subject to confirm figure. Subject states nothing is up there and begins to climb. Figure draws out a camera view after first rung is touched by subject who ascends without incident. At the top of the tunnel, no other life is seen. S nothing has been disturbed. Subject insists nothing was there and closes the hatch, then immediately vomits. Subject coughs and uses a supplied water bottle to gargle, then freezes and asks if Control is hearing that. Control reports no audio. Subject approaches cellar hatch cautiously with firearm drawn and lifts her head just enough so camera can view outside area. In the distance, approximately 700 meters from the farm, two massive humanoid beings are crawling across the landscape. The entities do not notice the subject who remains quiet, but whose drawn sidearm is visibly trembling. Subject requested to remain still and silent as beings move. They are featureless, facing at an angle moving across the field of vision so the faces are only visible for a few moments. During this time, it is clear they have no facial features. The arms they use to drag themselves are short at times and long at others, stretching out to varying lengths each time they move. There is no rear area to the beings, all bodily design appears to end at the torso. The two creatures take approximately ten minutes to disappear into the distance before the subject begins to panic and begs to return. Request declined. Subject instructed to enter the home from the cellar, do not leave the home under any circumstances. The first floor is entered through a hatch in the ceiling floor that opens with rusty creaks that cause subject to pause for 37 seconds before continuing upward and entering the kitchen. A heavy layer of dust coats all items in the kitchen. The refrigerator is left open. All food is spoiled. Adjacent to the kitchen is a living area that subject enters slowly. There is a recliner, a couch, and a television all of 1950s style design. In the recliner is a laptop whose case also resembles 1950s decor and is coated in heavy dust. Opening the laptop reveals the last moments of its operating system, Faithful OS, leaving a standby mode and immediately shutting off. Laptop has no external power source and will not power back on. When asked to recover laptop, it brings the cushion of the recliner with it, the two stuck together, subject advised to leave laptop where it is. The inside door leaving the home is nailed shut with thick wood planks, no attempt made to interact with these. Camera view pans to a staircase leading upstairs. Subject ascends the stairs without being asked and the stairs remain silent to control surprise. When subject reaches top of stairs, a hallway with two doors is viewed, one on each side, and at the end of the hall, a dumbwaiter is inlaid into the wall. Subject opens door on left on her own, which opens to a master bedroom. The bed is neatly made, but the wardrobe next to it is thrown open and clothes are everywhere on the floor. Subject finds laid out in the bed several pieces of jewelry and is informed to leave them. Subject begins to protest, then comments they stink and leaves them alone, promptly leaving room. Subject asks to open second door. The second door opens and gives a view of a shared children's bedroom, obviously boy and girl given the types of toys and clothes scattered on the floor. There is also a window which subject approaches and wipes with a curtain to clear dust. Subject requested to move camera to window and does so. The farmland is visible, and approximately 40 kilometers from it at best guess, a city. As the camera starts to draw back, it pans down and films the area around the house. Approximately 300 figures similar to those from the footage captured during blue test are visible around the home, all staring up. Subject asks to confirm figures but states nothing is there. Subject requested to return and quickly agrees. Egress from the house is uneventful. Pulley system shows no erratic behavior. As subject returns to point of pulley wire's origin, a loud groaning noise causes the picture to reverberate. Technicians at control report they were also able to hear the noise and experience the vibration. Subject returns through point of origin without investigation and mirror returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 relinquished. Video ends. Return newspaper fragments filed as… The next test is classified as the Violet Test.
SCP-093 Violet Test Mirror Test 3 Color Violet Subject is D-84930, male, 21 years of age, average physique. Subject's background shows an instance of second-degree murder of a police officer during a drug bust. Normally this crime, while severe, would not qualify a person for a sentence that would end up with us, but the murder of the officer with especially brutal and excessive violence was used. This subject was uncooperative and had to be reminded that his cooperation would only benefit him. Subject entered the provided mirror while holding SCP-093, which emitted a violet color. Outside technicians observed that the mirror retained a true reflection until subject had completely passed into it, at which time the view changed to a cityscape, urban, lightly tinged in purple, similar to the first test. Video feed follows in attached media. Camera flickers to life and pans around the area. Subject is in what appears to be a modern downtown district similar to a city like New York. The streets are mostly bare except for a few cars of unknown make or model. These cars look highly advanced and streamlined. Subject attempts to look into the car windows without being instructed to, but backs away remarking there is a rank-ass stink coming from the areas around most of them. Subject is persuaded to move closer to one car and does so with coughing, wiping off a mirror which is covered in dirt. The inside of the car appears to be completely filled with a strange brown matter. There is nothing at all visible other than the brown matter. Two other cars produce the same results, however, a fourth vehicle seems more recent than the others and the insides are immaculate. The doors to this vehicle also are unlocked and subject quickly gets inside then shuts the doors. Subject is chastised for this behavior by controlling who reminds him his lifeline is nothing more than a cable, which is sturdy enough that closing the car door does not injure it, but they cannot recover a person in motion. Subject argues with control over this issue and pans the camera across the dashboard, pointing out he couldn't drive away even if he tried. The dashboard is void of any recognizable controls, no ignition, no steering. It has several small blank screens that are theorized to be a GPS system. Subject remains in the car while Control discusses how to proceed since the city landscape is far larger than the previous test destinations. Control debates this issue while Subject stares around the cityscape from the car. During one pan, a face is clearly seen staring into the car, eyes watching the Subject. However, this was not noticed until post-test footage review. Subject made no comment regarding this entity at any point. Control shortly after informs Subject to remain where he is and an escort team is dispatched through the mirror to join him. A team of four armed personnel is sent through the mirror and proceeds to Subject's location. Subject is then instructed to remove his harness, which is recovered. This subject's video feed then ends and is replaced by a wireless unit used by the escort team. The video quality on this unit is subject to more interference, but in order to mark the mirror exit, a receiver system is placed through the mirror. Subject leaves the car and now travels with the escort team. Given the myriad of possible options, they are instructed to simply move to the closest building and attempt to enter it. This building has etched glass doors bearing the name XEA. Research Partners Incorporated, and the doors are ajar. A magnetic lock system is present, but has lost power. The team enters the building and main lobby. This area resembles a stereotypical corporate lobby. There is a C-shaped receptionist desk with a chair pushed far from it as if it was left in a hurry. A PC terminal is at the desk as well. The team approaches the desk and the camera bearer is instructed to examine the PC. The unit does appear to have power and Faithful OS appears on the screen requesting a login and password. A keyboard is present but is remarkably slim with touch-sensitive keys rather than press-down keys. After one failed attempt, the lock screen replies that maximum attempts have been exceeded and the PC turns off. No actual tower or power button can be located, so team moves forward. Behind the receptionist's desk are two elevator doors, one to the left and one to the right with similar touch-sense keys. The elevator on the left is broken, the door open, and the shaft empty. The elevator on the right appears functional and has power. Without a clear destination, the team is instructed to proceed to the highest floor to get a lay of the city. All floors appear to be accessible, with the highest being 114. In reality, 112 and 13 and 113 are missing from the keypad. Journey up the elevator is uneventful during this time. The elevator does appear to take longer as it passes by 13 and then 113, suggesting that an entire floor was built and nothing put on it. At 114, the doors open and team enters a large lounge-type area. There are many couches with dust on them. A widescreen 
apparently LCD TV of approximately 60 plus inches in size dominates the wall in front of them with no power. A series of windows are open, allowing in sunlight at the far end, to which the team proceeds and angles the camera outside. The view of the city is astonishing. This building is one of the tallest visible, but certainly not alone in its stature. The city below is gray and silent, no evidence of life at this altitude. Some buildings in this city have a strange brown growth that appears to have been splashed against them as if a gelatinous mass was flung and then seeped down before hardening. Other buildings have floors where the glass has been shattered and the same brown substance is seeping out the edges. One member of the team calls the camera bearer to the windows on the other side. From the other side of the building, the city edges can be seen. Attention is pointed toward an expressway that encircles the city upon which crawls another one of the large half-body humanoids, dragging itself with its elastic arms as witnessed in previous tests. It travels the highway then moves out of sight. The team returns to the elevator and notes that a button has already been activated for floor 74. No one has approached the elevator so the team agrees to travel to this floor. On the 74th floor, the door opens and reveals a waiting area to what appears to be a doctor's office. At the reception desk there is a sign-in sheet with a series of names and dates. The dates on the sign-in sheet all carry the year 1953. A PC at the receptionist area is on and functioning at a user desktop. The background for the PC is a large set of praying hands with the word Faithful OS under them. On the desktop are a series of folders with years on them containing files that, when clicked using the center button of the mouse, open to a word viewer. All files appear to be appointment information. On the desk is a notepad titled, From the Desk of Dr. Boroziski, Blessed Purificationalist. The door to the doctor's area is sketched with the same name and title, as well as a crucifix. Opening this door leads to a white, dust-free hallway that has two examination rooms and a key-coded door at the end. The examination rooms are unremarkable and typical of any doctor's office. All medicine cabinets are empty. A small amount of C4 is placed to lock to the key-coded door at the request of control and then blown, forcing the door open. The area it opens into is much larger than the reception area itself and seems to contain a series of large containment capsules. There are a total of six of these capsules. Two are broken and a brownish-amber material coats the floor coming from them. One is empty. The last three have nude humans floating in them with breathing masks. Attached to the front of these tubes are medical charts showing vital signs and conditions. For symptoms, the chart explains in somewhat awkward English ailments that seem more like flaws or personality of character, or just incidents that have occurred with the patient. Control asks for a zoom of one of the patient pages on the chart. After focusing, it reads, Citizen Jennifer McZerka did suffer a lapse of the heart that did lead her to lay with her labor twice upon nights of her husband's departure from their home. Patient did submit herself into the Lord's in our hands for cleansing of mind and body. Prayer administered by High Father Uwakalakin, and patient submitted to a three-day period in the Lord's tears to cleanse her system, then released in good spirits. The topmost page reads, Citizen Alberius Fairfan struck out a High Father during a sermon, blaspheming that the Lord's tears did turn his daughter to be unright in mind and heart, thusly laying the blame for her whorish activities at the feet of the High Father and his blessing. With no proof of these blasphemes, the forgiving judge and the punishing judge did agree that Alberius Fairfan should bathe in the Lord's tears himself for a week to be cleansed of mind and soul, thus to prove his daughter's ways are fault of not the father's hands, and to give him peace of self. Subject who had been traveling quietly with the escort team now begins to panic. The camera pans to focus on him and he's surrounded by entities similar to those witnessed in the first two tests. Escort team reports in that Subject is having a panic attack, but Control requests them to stand still and wait. Subject screams at the entities, which are denied to exist by Team Commander, stating Subject is alone in the corner. Control requests that one team member be dispatched to approach and recover the Subject. The Escort team member approaches the Subject as ordered. On the video, the figures part to make a pathway for the approaching member who lifts Subject to his feet and brings him out of the corner. Figures on video are then seen closing ranks to close the path. Subject is lifted to the feet by an arm and escorted through the figures that close their ranks when the subject is moved. They remain steadfastly staring at the subject no matter where he moves to. Control requests the team to return now. 
team turns to leave before leaving, a team member mentions something noticed at the reception desk, a binder labeled The Lord's Tears. Control requests binder be returned as well and is stowed in the subject's field kit. The team returns to the elevator and returns to the ground floor. Upon leaving the building, subject points down the street towards the direction of entry point. The camera pans to a section of raised expressway across which one of the large torsos is crawling slowly. The entity turns its featureless head to look at the escort team, raises its head to the sky and emits a bellowing sound. Team leader issues the order to move, heading for the spot marked by the wireless video receiver. The creature on the expressway extends an arm down that stretches to touch the ground before the camera moves to the port. All team members say one move through entry point. Subject moves through entry point and mirror re returns to reflective surface. SCP-093 is dropped by Subject who panics and tries to fight his way out of the room. Subject is terminated by Team Leader after he draws the field kit pistol. Team Leader requests Portal be reopened, but it takes several minutes to find someone who can hold SCP-093 and generate a similar color. When a matching color is displayed and applied to the mirror, the video receiver is visible and all individuals report a horrific smell. Team Leader moves through the entryway with Control Person. The uniform and possessions of the escort team member who was left behind are presently recovered, but the member himself is nowhere to be seen and does not respond to shouts. Member assumed KIA and wireless receiver recovered. Control and escort turn through at entry point and mirror returns to reflective surface. Later review of the recovered camera shows escort member grasping at the air where entry point should be and then turning to look up at the oversized torso. A brown gel seems to drip off the creature as it moves and disappears shortly after being dislodged as if evaporating. Several shots are fired at the creature's face with the automatic weapon carried by that land in the face of the creature, causing a spray of less vicious brown liquid to pour forth from the wounds. Screams obscenities at the face of the creature descend upon him and the camera is pushed to the ground. Camera feed remains dark for approximately 65 seconds before light comes back and the camera films the creature crawling back to the expressway and pulling itself onto it, then crawling in the direction it was originally headed. Believed to have been absorbed by the creature and perhaps digested, this may have been an example of how these unknown entities feed by direct contact with living material. Further study is recommended to be avoided on this issue. Returned ledger filed as the next test is classified as the yellow test. SCP-093 Yellow Test Mirror Test 4, Color Yellow D-Class subjects no longer authorized for testing. Testing focus has been shifted to data collection after analyzing the articles brought back from the previous three tests to better understand the fate of the world accessed by SCP-093 and determine if safeguards or practices are required for our own world. Analysis of the brown fluid on the clothing of the lost escort team member has been filed with other recovered articles. Doctor has volunteered for this test as out of the possible candidates he was able to cause SCP-093 to undergo a new color change. There is no evidence in Doctor's background of any illegal or criminal behavior, nor of any psychological problems. When presented to the mirror, the view changed to that of a cubicle office environment. For this test, Doctor opted to use the wireless video system and forgo the pulley return system, stating he was confident he would be as safe as none of the torso creatures had been witnessed within a building where the mirror's destination showed. Video feed commences after Dr. has crossed the mirror. As with prior tests, SCP-093's current color, yellow, tinges all video material. Camera flickers to life and pans across a series of plain white cubicle constructs. Approximately 30 are visible. At the far end from the point of entry is an office module built into the wall with frosted glass walls and a glass door. Doctor approaches this door and investigates the etched writing on it. Senior Manager Stanley Millimits. The door is unlocked. Doctor enters the office and examines the desk. A coffee cup is on the desk, a dark brown stain covering half of the inside as the liquid evaporated. 
There is a donut on a plate which Dr. picks up and lobs at a wall. On impact, it dumps like a rock and falls. A file cabinet in the corner of the room draws Dr. attention, and he goes through each shelf one at a time, stopping in the second drawer and taking out a file, then going back to the first and taking out two others. Continuing to the third and fourth drawers, he withdraws four additional files and spreads them all out on the desk. The files are blue filing folders, and he points with a finger and camera at a symbol on each of the praying hands, stating aloud for the camera that all other files are stored in yellow folders. The blue folders are placed in his field kit. Camera attention is turned to the PC on the desk that is logged in and functional. Doctor comments aloud wondering where these devices are getting their power from as he knows no power outlets. The PC's desktop contains the logo of Faithful OS and even has sounds. Clicks of the mouth followed by soft hymnite hums, an opening of icons followed by angelic bells. The PC fails to yield any useful information to Doctor who abandons it and leaves the office. Approaching the other end of the office floor, Doctor presses a button on the wall for the elevator and enters, finding he is on the 34th floor of a building having an unusual number scheme. The keypad layout goes from negative 115 to 115 and includes all floors. Before pressing a floor button, Doctor requests that the wireless video transponder be moved to the elevator and replaced with a construction cone to mark the entry point. A second transponder unit is placed outside the elevator and control is instructed to recover the second unit and seal the test chamber should something happen to him. Then when all is arranged, he presses the button for floor negative 115. The descent down the elevator is long, consuming 15 minutes. During this time, the camera experiences one malfunction where the image jerks and turns to snow, returning to show 14 other figures in the elevator with Dr. as video pans around, all of whom move as he moves to allow him space. They remain for 35 seconds, then the camera flickers to snow and returns. Dr is now alone in the elevator, dancing as assumed by the ducks and sways of the video speed. Doctor pauses to comment on a rising stench coming from below. At this point, the elevator has reached floor negative 108. Doctor presses negative 110 to interrupt the descent down and exit when that floor is reached. The elevator door is open to an enclosed observation deck with several PCs and chairs. All PCs appear to have power. The ceiling to this deck is also glass, and above it another deck is visible. Doctor approaches the monitoring station to check one of the PC screens. On the screen is the Faithful OS logo and a video feed toggling between four different views. The first view is a room of tubes similar to those found in Test Violet, which number in the thousands. The second view is a closer-up view of these tubes as a camera glides in front of each to monitor the contents. All tubes the camera passes by are broken. The third view is facing the opposite direction as the camera glides vertically, checking each observation station. A total of ten can be counted and Dr. is visible as the camera passes by its own station. Looking up, a hovering camera unit with no visible means of propulsion glides up past him. The fourth view shows the ground floor below the observation deck where a single, astonishingly large torso being is crawling in circles, bumping into walls and changing directions. From the camera feed, the creature's estimated size is six stories. Returning attention to the contents of the PC, Doctor moves the video log aside and see a simple text editor that was hidden behind it. A printout of this text was recovered and filed in the field kit. The printout directed Dr. to a safe on floor 54 and provided a combination. Dr. leaves the observation deck and proceeds to 54 without event, arriving on a cubicle off its floor. He proceeds to the desk mentioned in the document and found a safe hidden behind a desk, undisturbed. The combination provided opens the safe and reveals a notebook, filed in the field kit, and a peculiar revolver that has been returned as in addition to the 24 rounds of ammo found with it. Doctor proceeds back to the elevator without event and returns to 34. Given the sheer number of floors available to explore and the vital information obtained from the observation deck, the test is considered over and equipment is retrieved. Before returning through the entry point, Doctor 
investigates a terminal nearby that has power and finds it shows the exact same screen the one on negative 110 shows. It is theorized that the author of the note installed a network virus to propagate it through the building so any PC on that network could be found in the information discovered. Doctor returns to the entry point and the mirror returns to a reflective surface. All material filed with other SCP-093 recovered materials, analysis of and the ammunition for it postponed for reason that it would require the deconstruction of one of the rounds and it may be beneficial until testing of SCP-093 is resolved. Video ends. The next test is classified as the Red Test. SCP-093 Red Test SCP-093 Mirror Test 5 Color Red SCP-093 distributed among staff until a new color could be generated by contact with it. Service technician was able to cause SCP-093 to take on a fierce red hue and glow, much brighter than the object's normal color. Agreed to assist with a test of SCP-093. Per Dr. Request given to technician for use in this test. When applied to the mirror for the test, SCP-093 generates an unknown environment. No color tinge appears present on the display destination, which is comprised of red stonework. Technician enters the mirror and video capture begins. Video flickers to life and technician known hereafter as subject is viewing a large, cylindrical pillar that is rotating on its own. Object is of unknown height and appears to be six feet in width. Holes are distributed throughout the object at seemingly random intervals. On occasion a beam of white light is emitted from these holes. Turning of the camera finds that the beams are connected to a multitude of objects similar to SCP-093 that are part of the room's walls. The room turns out to be cylindrical in shape with countless copies of SCP-093. Subject turns back to entry point and finds it is a section of the wall that is missing its copy of SCP-093, presumably the one carried with subject. Other sections of the wall and inspection are also found to be missing their copies, leading to speculation that this may be some sort of central array. Subject finds a ladder in the floor while examining the room and proceeds down it at Control's request. The ladder exits into a large, clean room full of computer equipment that appears antiquated compared to previously encountered equipment. Large computers running on reel-to-reels are clicking and spinning at various locations. A light bulb of unknown meaning turns on for ten seconds and turns off. A large CRT monitor is displaying single words in eight colors at roughly five-second intervals. While observed, the words clean, unclean, clean, clean, lost, unclean flash on the screen. Proceeding through the room, it ends in a large glass window with another observation deck. This deck looks out over another series of tubes as witnessed before, but far fewer and filled with a blue liquid. What appears to be electrical current dances over many of the tubes at erratic intervals. At least five tubes at first glance are empty and broken. At the observation window, a keyboard is present on a pedestal awaiting a selection to be made. The options available on the screen are Tube Status, which waits for a numerical input, Reports, Situation X-549, Situation X-550, Evacuation Log, Bullshit, Agent, Report, and Facility Fire Plan. Video expunged, all selections that generated text were transcribed by subject and verified by a control member who passed through the portal to recover them. This process took approximately two hours and video feed was deleted to condense the report. Recorded documents are filed as Video Interrupted Control lost contact with subject approximately 30 minutes after departure of Control Tech. Subject was asked to remain in area and observe the machinery and the containment room to make observations for debriefing. The SCP-093 mirror portal returned to a reflective surface prematurely and all video contact with subject was lost. Control was unable to re-establish due to SCP-093 being across the mirror. A time lapse of 1 minute and 48 seconds was recorded before Mirror Portal re-established itself and subject returned through Portal. 
Subject appeared to be in good health and condition despite the time loss, but spoke little. During immediate debriefing, subject underwent sudden convulsions and medical staff was alerted. While attempting to subdue subject, he displayed enhanced strength and used to shoot one of the debriefing staff, killing them. Guard shot subject once with the sidearm in the heart and once in the chest, but subject did not fall. All staff evacuated room and a second shot was fired by subject with mist. A more heavily armed team entering the briefing room and used automatic weapons to dispatch subject. Reports confirmed that subject did not bleed when shot but instead leaked a green-brown substance that seemed to be a mix of solution observed in some containment tubes and the material recovered during Test 3. All further SCP-093 tests have been discontinued while review of materials recovered is in effect. A secondary tape recording device was found to have been activated in the field kit after loss of video feed, and its contents have been filed with other recovered materials. All recovered materials from SCP-093 testing are Level 4 classification. Release must be approved by no fewer than two Level 4 personnel. Staff with acceptable clearance, please sign in with Dr. for access to the materials recovered from SCP-093 tests. SCP-093 Recovered Materials Document All documents contained in this file are Class IV clearance requiring two signed approvals to access. Any employee reading past this point who does not have proper classification should consider themselves to be terminated from employment and now subject to disciplinary actions up to and including forced administration of Class A amnesic, immediate transfer to Keter Class Security, and death. Blue Test Newspaper Article 1 only one item could be recovered during our initial test, and that was a newspaper clipping found attached to a cork board in an abandoned bunker. Most of the articles were in a state of decay, but one was firm enough for recovery. Most Holy Father announces progress, unclean being cleansed. A rare public address directly from the Most Holy Father of the United Lands of the Sun has declared that the Blessed Militia has driven back many of the unclean who are skulking our lands now. New Rome, our capital, has been purged of the unclean, and citizens are encouraged to come back to their homes. Citizens who live in the surrounding countryside should not return to their farms, as the unclean still roam the fields and plains around our glorious city and continue to grow in size. The Blessed Militia has developed new weapons, which have proven capable of punishing the unclean and driving them back into the unfertile lands. Construction has begun of a system to permanently close the unfertile lands off from our blessed lands and each affected area once all the unclean have been driven away. The Most Holy requests that all citizens of our united lands bow in prayer and offer tithes to recognize the sacrifices of our blessed militia in these troubled times. Reports have been coming in that falsely accuse the Blessed Militia of having committed sin against the citizens whose homes they are inhabiting as they travel bravely through contaminated lands. The Most Holy would like to remind the people that blasphemy against any who wear his mark is the most grave of sin and unfounded accusations will be punished accordingly. We should work to support he and his men, however possible, just as they lay down their lives for us. The sinful rebels who Green Test Newspaper Articles 2, 3, 4, Diary Our second test recovered many materials that helped to establish a sequence of events for this alternate world. The diary recovered provided a glimpse into the last days of the owners of the home from which it was recovered and may represent activity in other areas of the world as well. Newspaper Article 2 Farms surrounding the city of Silver Feathers have reported being unable to contact neighbors across voice or video feeds in the last week. Until an approval is granted by the Regional High Father, an investigation cannot commence but he assures the people that these events have not escaped his attention. Residents are advised to notify their local blessed voice daily so any further disappearances can be addressed immediately. Residents are also advised to begin stalking their shelters to be ready for any situation. Newspaper Article 3 
Following the disappearance of the blessed voices from several outlying regions around the City of Silver Feathers, the Regional High Father has declared a concern for safety and livelihood. Under this declaration, all farmland residents must evacuate immediately to their shelters. Scattered reports of unclean have come in, but have yet to be verified. Newspaper Article 4 the City of Glorious Song has stopped responding to any and all communications. The words can only be assumed that our hearts go out to any who are in the region who are unable to hear our words. The City of Silver Feather's Blessed Militia has reported several incursions by the unclean into the city, and have exterminated four of the abominations before they become a danger to any residents. The Regional High Father reminds the citizens to avoid direct contact with the unclean. Conventional arms do nothing to the unclean, only the most holy of implements can penetrate their skin so do not put yourself in danger. Any citizens who suspect their neighbors indulging in heavy sin should immediately contact the Blessed Militia through designated checkpoints. Diary I have the distinct feeling we're going to die, so I'm going to write all this down for whoever comes along and finds our bones. My name is Hervas Jackalsiv, and I'm a farmer. I grows the rapsticks and the huskiers. We raise the inks and the ooms. It's me, my wife, Ophiri, and our two and our two little ones, Trevin and Listeria. I got this book and trade from the blessed man who came by for food and shelter. He told us to start getting our shelters ready and not to let no other blessed who coming by even know we're here. Says the whole thing break down, nothing right no more. So I does as he says, got it all ready, we're going down there in the next day or so. In the morning he was gone. He made the wife sad as he was polite to us unlike most of the others. Figure he didn't want to be no burden. Liss went out looking for him to be sure he weren't just around the house. He didn't turn up nowhere, so we guess he left. Strange enough, Liss found his clothes around a mile or so away and all his gear, but no him. She left it all there and asked for the best if that what happened I, that I think. I'm clearly no educated man, don't claim to be, but I can put two and two together and tell you that things are bad out there. For everyone, and especially for us, cause it's coming way too close, sometimes you can smell it. That's when we hide. Smells like a leg of meat that's been rotten for way too long, and just won't go back into the dirt. Even the soil rejected him, I guess, refusing to let him be buried to die. It came. Too fast. We weren't ready. The smell came in the night. Maybe we sh would have been fine, but the little ones were afraid, so we went to the shelter. Trev was slow. He saw it. Kept staring at it as it shambled by. It ignored us until he screamed when I was getting Liss and the mist down the shelter. I went to get him, but it was too fast. I saw him standing up there, screaming. And then its head came down up on him, pressed over him. He tried to run for the stairs, tried to get to us, but in a blink he was gone and it pulled away. His clothes fell in the cellar like he vanished out of them. I got into the shelter, slammed the hatch, and locked it. I think it knows we're here now. I'll try to get in. Take us too. No telling how long we got. Plenty of food, though. I was wrong. The food was rotten. Something got into it, or I just didn't notice. We're eating what we can. There's food, but not enough, and that thing ain't leaving. It's trying to find ways in, smelt the smell, coming from the life web plug in the wall. Something seeped through it and we kept away. It got all hard like a rock and don't smell no more. Maybe the power in the plug finally let it die. I went up to peek, cellar is fine, Trev's clothes still on the stairs. Peeked outside, we're not going to make it. There were ten, twenty, thirty. Couldn't count. So many. All go in a circle around the house, looking at it with those faceless faces, and the stink, oh the stink. Went back into the shelter and locked the door. I think I don't want to see my family rot away. I think faster is better. The miss, she agrees, we won't tell Lisa. She'll be first, then my wife, my love, then me. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I gave the best life to my family possible. It was them holy ones that brought this. I'm going to pin this in memory to my great pap. He was old and knew stories older than himself. Says those unclean they preach about, those unfertile zones they say stay out of, all cause of the most holy bringing the world together. Them things are the ultimate sin. Everything about us that was evil and pure, it's them. They don't know nothing, but they do them what they do. Don't even know why they do it. They just do it. Take us into them. Then we're gone. 
I asked Pap what they were and he hit, lit a stick, took a puff, and he said, Don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody who will admit it. But if you see this symbol, if you see it, you run, boy. You run fast, you run far, and you hide. And you never go back where you saw it. That's all I know. I remember the symbol was on the rock he kept on his neck under his shirt. Next day, Pap was gone, nowhere to be found. Dad weren't sad. Said he knew it happened when one dad. Pap went home. See you soon, Dad. Pap. Symbol matched symbol found on SCP-093 surface as one of the deeper engravings. Also matches symbols noticed on video feed on final test of SCP-093 duplicates. Violet Test Office Ledger The third test with SCP-093 resulted in the unfortunate loss of a security member, but also allowed us to recover a ledger with insight into the medical procedures carried out on the alternate Earth now termed E-093. Patient Jennifer McZerka Recovery Tube 001-1 Mixture 35% Tears 30% Nutrient 10% HFT 25% Blessing Summary Jennifer McZerka is 20 cycles of age and during her 18th cycle was the victim of a HOV ride accident that resulted in brain damage and misalignment of her moral processes. She is prone to violent outbursts and can only be calmed down by impure stimulation. Because of this, she actively seeks out strangers to mingle with and her parents have requested of the High Fodder that she be sent to the tears to mend her mind and body. Patient accepted. During preparation for the tears, subject went into a rage and the attending hand went to recover a sedative. Jennifer tore her clothes off and screamed impure words at me, so I locked the door and instructed the hand to wait outside. I am half shameful to admit I laid with Jennifer a total of seven times before purting her to the tears. It has been very long for me and her parents have abandoned her to our care, so care for her I will. Before setting her to the tears, I authorized a blessed probe of her body functions and found she is settled now with young and tests confirmed it shall be mine. I have mixed her bath to accommodate this and she will soak in the tears until her body is ready to give life. Patient None Recovery Tube 001-2 Mixture None Summary None Patient Alberius Fairfan Recovery Tube 001-3 Mixture 80% Tears, 20% Nutrient Alberius Fairfan is a farmer from outside the city of Silver Feathers who claims to have lost family to the unclean. He confronted the High Fathers of the city and demanded compensation and re retribution for the loss. The High Fathers denied the existence of unclean beyond the unfertile lands and refused compensation or retribution. Alberius struck a High Father and was arrested and sentenced to a cleansing of the soul. His mixture is primarily tears to seep into the soul and cleanse his heart and ease his pain. The law keeper stated family is indeed missing, so his sentence beyond the tears have been dropped in sympathy for their loss. I used the last of the FHT on Jennifer, or I would have used less tears on in his bath. 80% is higher than I'm comfortable with, but the HFT is becoming hard to obtain. I may have to go through the dark. Patient. Recovery Tube 002-1 Mixture 75% Nutrient 25% Blessing Summary A member of the Blessed Militia who was wounded in combat. Request is from the High Father. Details withheld. Patient Recovery Tube 002-2 Mixture 75% Nutrient 25% Blessing A member of the Blessed Militia who was wounded in combat. Request from the High Father. Details withheld. Patient Recovery Tube 002-3 Mixture 75% Nutrient 25% Blessing A member of the Blessed Militia who was wounded in combat requested from the High Father details withheld. Yellow Test PC Printout Safe Diary The fourth test in the E-093 provided us with documentation assumed to be written by a technician in either a medical or government facility. Found in the safe is being considered for SCP classification primarily due to the composition of the ammunition found with it and the advanced firing mechanism attached to what would, should be a very base firearm. PC Printout I did not trust the Overwatchers. I felt something was wrong years ago. Under my desk on floor 54 is a safe with a weapon in it. It is one of those used by the Blessed Militia. My brother has sent it to me. He says they are n also not what they claim. They have done things to our fellows even more vile than what the unclean would do. He tells me to be ready to fight. 
I cannot. It is not me. I do not know violence. I am too frail. You. Use it. Save yourself. Safe Diary My name is Herval Tolowis. I am a hard systems watcher here. My job is to monitor the sinful who bathe in the Lord's tears and then make sure they reach the prescribed dilution time. I have been doing this job for twenty-three years, and now things are falling apart. I can no longer abide by the Most Holy. I must speak the truth. We are being told to evacuate. The containment tubes have been breached. An unclean has appeared in the place of rest and we are unable to destroy it. The live motion footage shows how it came to be and this is what has unsealed my heart and mind and tongue. I must speak. Should the Overwatchers see this, I will be silent so I must hide it. Thankfully they are ignorant with the hardware so I can hide this easily. The Overwatchers told us we should leave last to ensure the hardware contains the unclean. What that means is we should distract it and die in case it breaches the watching decks. It has shattered nearly all the tubes and absorbed the people in them. I have dispatched the eyes to the unclean and they have touched it, bringing me back a sample of it. The unclean are not sinners. They are not products of our disobedience. I suspect they are us. The eyes have dated the sample. It is older than myself, older than my elders. It is over two hundred cycles in ages. Two hundred! The sirens are still sounding, but no signal has come for us to leave. I do not think this unclean is alone. I have seen how they get into places, between places. Between places? Is that where they have been all this time? Between places? The makeup of the unclean is unstable. Molecules detach and reattach almost before my eyes as if to move the entire thing reforms itself in space and time. Why does it not come up here? Too much effort? Or does it not sense me? They have no eyes, no mouth, no face, they cannot speak, cannot see, but they must be able to sense us. The smell. It is so strong. It comes from all directions. It is not a smell of the dead. It is a smell that comes from something that should be dead but does not know how to die. The War of the Holy Union. I think that was where it may have started. We are united under the Most Holy, but what does he owe us? Nothing. We merely keep society running while those on high benefit. Is this not how it's always been? But now we are told we are pleasing the will of those above us in the clouds, those great beings who gave us the power to live and prosper. Those who have we have never laid eyes upon but are told we must revere, lies, all of it, it must be. I am using the eyes to create a fluid to oppose the makeup of the unclean sample. Perhaps they will cancel each other out. I will leave soon and store the rounds here. I cannot use the weapon. I am too weak a man for this. I will protect my family with my mind and not with my rage. We will be safe in the fields. I know where to go. I will go above now, to my family. I will leave the hardware running. I was told to turn it off, but this is where I defy them. It will run. This will watch. The eyes will see for however much time they have. Someone will read this and someone will know. Take the gun. Take the fluid, do not listen to the Most Holy. We did, and we are damned. It is a revolver-style weapon, with two twelve-bullet cylinders. The design of the gun has one cylinder on each side, raised slightly, so they may flip into the gun itself and then rotate, firing all around before flipping back out and allowing it to be reloaded while the second is usable following a total of twenty-four shots before it runs empty. There is no firing pin on this gun, but instead there is a pullback slide mechanism that must be used to prime the active cylinder. At the time of recovering, all 24 slots contain a syringe-style bullet with 32 needles on the end. On impact, it is assumed the force of the shot will press the liquid inside of the target. None have been tested. Of express interest is that these cylinders can hold standard 45 caliber ammunition, which has been tested. The gun uses an ultra-high-power magnetic rail system to deliver a shot so the gunpowder in the bullet is never used. In consideration is a redesign of a round that would utilize the gunpowder mid-flight to add even higher velocity to the round, or that would explode on impact for higher yield. Red Test PC Printouts The final authorized test with SCP-093 resulted in the loss of a skilled service technician but allowed us to recover very revealing documents that can only be assumed to have not been intended for public knowledge in any world. Curious among these is Agent report, which appears to have been written by a Foundation employee several decades ago. 
While these paper printouts were the best material recovered, it seems that the system used to create them allowed for multiple forms of input, including typed and verbal speech to text. Some audio logs of the printouts below are available but must be requested in advance with fully written explanations as to why. This dual input system seems to explain the variances in the style between users, as well with assumptions made on the part of the software while performing conversions. Fire Facility Plan in the event of any emergency requiring the facility be evacuated, all Clear Force staff should report to Train Station 3 and use their vial to call the evacuation train. Only one vial is required to call the train and may contain any amount of tears. An empty vial will not call the train. Clear 2 and 1 staff should remain at their post until either 10 minutes after departure of Clear 4 persons or until authorized by Clear 4 staff. Clear 3 staff should utilize the protective garments at their stations and weapon lockers before proceeding to designated crisis areas as dictated by Clear 4 staff. Reports. Three unfertile zones have increased 25% in size in the last seven days. Containment teams are not finding any presence of unclean in these zones, but they are visibly confirmed as expanding. Clear 5 level High Fathers have confirmed breaches in the holy chambers at each of these zones. All chambers found empty. It is believed the unclean have breached containment on the holy chambers, dispatching additional guard to remaining chambers. Situation X549 Expansion of Zone 64TO has been confirmed. Unfertile zone containment procedures in effect. Containment staff dispatched to site. This is the tenth report in 30 days, upgrading the situation status. Reports from Clear 5 High Fathers have stopped at all affected. The city of his word has been placed on full lockdown and all travel denied in or out. Other cities are now in alert mode and combat teams are being dispatched to city perimeters. Situation X-550 The great land of Hufusa has fallen per satellite images. Entire landmass considered tainted. Outbreak of sin reported in Lavinna, and that landmass has requested assistance from the Holy Union. Assistance denied due to our own outbreak and mass reportings of unclean. Clear 10 staff have issued the order to evacuate via the gateway and for all Holy Union authorized persons to proceed to the nearest sky platform for evacuation to Star Sky Eden to continue monitoring status. Gateway keys are being ejected to prevent spread from the center to other space time vectors. Resurrecting staff are being awakened to monitor and continue reports here as we evacuate. May his blessings forgive our greatest sin. Evacuation Log Evacuation in progress. Shuttle 1 away. Shuttle 2 away. Shuttle 3 error, 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 error. Release us, release us, release us. Why, 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 why? Shuttle 3 error launch aborted. Proceed to Shuttle 4. Shuttle 4 reporting delayed launch overloaded. Triage protocols engaged. Shuttle 4 reports passenger limit obtained preparing to launch. Why, why, why? Release us, why, release us. Why, what? Us, what did we do? Why, why, system detecting electrostatic activity, compensating, compensating, comp, 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 comp. Ones and zeros. R, why are we hurt? What did we do? Why were we hurt? What did we do? System shutdown. System restore purge of contaminated data in progress. Why us? Why us? Why us? Why us? Why us? Why us? Why listen? Record 5432. Dash one zero four dash three nine two password forgive us five 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 four 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 three three two 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 more twos ones why 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 system purge purge per bullshit report what the fuck is this place lol Okay, so like, there are people typing stuff here, so I'm going to type too, lol. So like, I found this rock in the pond by the house and it was all kind of glowy and stuff when I picked it up. So I'm like, oh wow, pretty, and when I picked up, picked it up, the pond, you couldn't see the bottom, it was this weird room with a glowy rock thing. Lol. I don't know, so I like, I guess fell into it, oops, and now I'm here, and not there, and really I'm kind of scared. But this place is like a movie set, so it's cool, lol. There's some guy I can hear talking, he keeps asking me to come downstairs, but I don't see no door. He keeps screaming for help too, cause I told him to eat me, laugh, and he won't shut up. I guess I could try going back into that room, but it's so creepy in there, I'm sorta of scared to, to laugh. 
Oh, so hey, I found a door. It's like in the floor of on a wall. So like, I'm going to tell that guy yelling to shut it up so I can go home. Be back later. Agent report. My name is and I am an agent at the Foundation. The year in my world is 1972. I assume it is the same in this world, but from what I've seen due to SCP-093, life on this world ended at approximately 1954. I have used SCP-093 to visit a number of locales starting and ending here in the center. I have seen the landscapes where no grass will grow. I have run from the unclean as they pursue anything they sense. I have no understanding of how they hunt, but I have learned what they are. Approximately 350 years ago or so, this world experienced a technological boom ours did not. The source of this seems to have been the arrival of He, a godlike being of unknown origin. He declared the world unclean and full of sin, and the only way to purge itself of the sin was to purge the sinners. A war, whoever was left alive was clean. Amazing advances in science were bestowed to all cultures for a period of ten years to prepare them for this war, and during that time he disappeared. The war happened anyways. The instigator, the Holy Union of Land, apparently the landmass that for us would become the United States. Records are sketchy and books that detail anything about this time period are forbidden in the world. I located a cache of recorded history by following a series of corrupted computer communications. It seems the primary weapon used in this war for his love was in fact people exposed to something called His Holy Tears, a liquid compound I have seen in use even today in abandoned medical facilities. His Holy Tears purge from the sin from the unclean and make them love him. At least that's what the label states. The records I've recovered are very unclear about how this war was waged except to state His Holy Chosen walked the lands of the sinful and took their sin unto themselves. Those who cried for his salvation received it and are now our children. Those who denied his love were purified in his radiance. But something apparently happened no one knew how to deal with. The unclean, the large creatures that are half a man and devour whatever they touch that lives and breathes. I actually found a scientific report written by someone who stumbled here with a SCP-093 copy. These creatures are the result of exposure to a very pure form of his tears, resulting in a genetic apocalypse occurring within the exposed. There are terms in here, something about quantum restructuring. I don't understand any of this, but it means there were once humans like everyone else, that couldn't be controlled, but they could be contained. They seem to be attracted to his tears, and a central point was established in various regions where a person with the purest form of his tears stays, keeping the unclean in that area known as an unfertile land. Something went wrong with that too, not sure what, but everything fell apart. The power structure, the culture, the people, all of it fell to ruins and now these things shamble around the land as its new owners, with no purpose or direction. You can stand next to one if you can stand the stink and they just slip right past you. If you catch their attention though, that's it. They move like lightning if they need to, and like a snail unless they have a reason to speed up. Sometimes I think they chase just to do it, others they move to kill. I think someone is in this facility, or someone's. I keep hearing voices and requests coming from areas under the floor. I want to leave this before I explore the facility any further. I have sent SCP-093 back through the entry mirror to seal that gate. These things can't be let into our world, nor should we have anything to do with this one. We're simply not smart enough to understand at all, I feel. I don't think the unclean can die. They're immortal, but they don't want to be. They just want to die. They're in my head, I think. I didn't notice it until now, but equipment in his room is starting to react to me, words on the screen begging for help. I I remember touching the tears, smelling it, tasting it, just a touch. Not eating it, just touching to it, tasting for acidity. We have pretty stupid investigative procedures, I think, haha. <laughs> the High Fathers are alive. They have technology we only imagine in our comics given by him. Some of the records on this machine indicate space travel, but they didn't go far, just far enough to watch the world fall apart and wait to come back and take it. But if they're up there, who is in this building with me? I've seen the faces of the people, the unclean. They show up on the pictures cast by the machine, in the room with me, watching me, I think. I, they're everywhere on this world, only seen by machines now. They don't look sad or happy, just curious. They want to know why. Why them? Why did it all happen? I don't know. I just don't know. They showed me things when I touched them, and it's not quite like the records say. The unclean remember it all. Every person they touch becomes part of them. 
safe inside them, but dead to us. Every mind, every feeling, every terror, it's eternal to them. I kinda want to join them, but too much to do. They want me to find him. Kill him. There was no war. It was him, 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 him. It. It. It came from between the folds of time and space and worlds and light and dark, something that is but should not be slipped in and called out to them as their god, and they believed it, and they tasted it, and touched it, and laid with it, and became its property and did its will, and it is still here. The SCP-093 it brought with it pulled forcefully with it, built it. I don't know, they don't know, but it belongs to him. It lets him move between places, between worlds, so I broke it. Ha! <laughs> I threw pieces of it away and through holes so those doors are closed just like ours is closed, and I can't go home, so what else can I do? It calls out through the rock, somehow. It knows where they are, but can't touch them. But if you hide the rock, he can't call out and he's stuck too. I got you, you son of a bitch. I got you. Bang bang. Ha ha. I touched him, with my fist and my gun, and he fell down. But he'll get right back up. Soon. I'm sorry. I did all I could. Let me sleep now. Please. Let me. Sleep.